So the date is 8th of August 2017 and for the last couple of days the news were awash with this exciting story of these blood sucking freaks on a Melbourne beach. If you haven't listened already the story is about a 16 year old Aussie boy named Sam Kenaize. Uh, and long story short, he was either surfing or playing softball on a beach or something. And he spent, I don't know, a longish time standing still in the sand. And then when he moved, uh, he saw that there was something like little goblets of sand attached to his feet and calves. And he brushed them off and suddenly... They started bleeding like hell and the first this news was reported the news explicitly said that the boy had wounds that did not stop bleeding and it turned out that this was an attack by a previously unrecognized form of little uh, sea crustaceans they are like the relatives of your garden pill bug but in a marine form and the mystery was further solved when the next day uh, Sam Kenaize's father in a typically resourceful Aussie fashion went up to that beach and collected a bucket of those fuckers from the sand and fed them meat and posted a YouTube video and it's really exciting that you see all these little rice like uh, shrimps swarming around these goblets of meat and they, they're like one of these you know cheap 1980s piranha films and it looks like this is a kind of behavior that no one noticed or saw or experienced before and of course there were the usual tropes like was Australia mate where everything is trying to kill you the sand is trying to kill you ah if I had a penny every time I heard someone sprout this piece of crap nonsense really like this urban legend that Australia is a place where everything is out there to kill you and it's super poisonous all these snakes and come on I mean you know, I live in a part of the world that's almost the antipode of Australia. It's as far away from that continent as you can get. And the people who live here, like city living people everywhere else, are completely ignorant about the world outside their town. And one of the biggest tropes we have about Australia is like, yeah, it's a nice place to visit. And then one says, <clears throat> no, it's too far away. And then always there's this pansy who says, I can't go there. It's too full of bugs. As if the moment you disembark from the airplane, all these bugs are going to be swarming every orifice of your body and everything. No, I have been to Australia and I actually had to look hard in order to find something that was even remotely dangerous so it's a complete nonsense and yeah a lot of poisonous animals do live in that continent but hey I mean there's many species of rattlesnake in North America and in Brazil there's lots of snakes and poisonous animals and you don't see those places getting called worlds of death <coughs> so yeah I had to get that gripe out of the way but anyways let's talk more about this interesting incident first and foremost it's very interesting from a scientific point of view not from the boy's point of view but I guess he wasn't seriously hurt either there was just lots of blood and actually that's what I found interesting the fact that there's a little animal that 
can bite people and they bleed you know it's no big deal but there was a lot of blood and as I told before in the news it was first reported that the kids wounds did not stop bleeding and this prompted me to look at this in a way that from what I have been able to see on the internet so far no one has considered yet these little water crustaceans may contain a potent form of anticoagulant in their saliva or their blood or their mouth parts or whatever and I think this really warrants further research you may ask you know what's anticoagulant anticoagulant is the scientific term for anything that stops the clotting of blood and actually anticoagulant drugs to my armchair information are very hard and rare to come by so there's a constant research about new anticoagulant drugs the ones that we already have have bad side effects like poisoning or heart attack risk and so people are turning to nature to find more anticoagulant drugs obviously since time immemorial people have used leeches for this purpose leeches as you obviously know are blood drinkers and they have this antiseptic and anticoagulant pro property to their saliva that basically ensures a constant flow of gushing from their food source but they're also so fastidious and clean that people use them after surgeries to stop blood clotting around wounds or if you have uh, sort of like flesh poisoning after a scar leeches do a great job up of cleaning that up actually so that's one thing another area people turn in search of anticoagulants is the world of plants and now i'm looking at a uh, herbs with natural anticoagulant properties page and there plants like ginkgos ginsengs hawthorns horse chestnuts and turmeric are listed as having anticoagulant properties of one form or the other so that's very interesting you know beyond the gore appeal or the aussie everything is out there to kill you trope these little sand chiggers have this kind of unique potential that i think should be investigated so melbourne is home to one of the world's leading research in research research universities and if anyone is listening from melbourne or the university of melbourne which is that establishment that i just told you about please give this a look you know it may open up a whole new avenue of research i mean it's certainly worth considering maybe you could develop a new medicine out of this or maybe not you know this is just my armchair assessment in half an hour of news reading so i harbor no illusions but still if that boy could bleed that much from a few bites from these little sea mites there's certainly some anticoagulation going on and who knows if you're interested in this issue please let me know in the comments and if you're an australian listener please you know tell people about this and you can tell that old man memo sent you ha another interesting point about these sand chiggers is their behavior actually okay so years ago i was filming a kind of school project a documentary about parasites and i was studying in london at that time 
and I went to the Natural History Museum, the Parasitology Department, and uh, it was such a nice time. I talked to different specialists, so, you know, parasites are not one family. Many different animals or even plants become parasites independently. So there are parasitologists who specialize in fish, parasitologists who specialize in worms, and there was one gentleman who was a specialist on copepods and other crustaceans, basically. And he told me something very interesting, which still is a kind of base tenet of my thinking when I'm considering unusual phenomena in nature or biology. And he said, parasitic crustaceans or animals are actually biologically speaking not much different from related crustaceans who are actually prey items to the parasites hosts so imagine there's this little shrimp and that shrimp is actually a natural food source of one type of fish now that fish also happens to have a parasite who is related to the shrimp that they are eating so at one point something must have happened that one of these shrimps must have said enough is enough and like turned on to attack the fish or just something really went haywire in their behavioral reflectors so the reflex they would associate with the fish changed from an escape reflex to a kind of almost perverse desire to attack and feed on it there are other examples like this i know this one classic genus of beetles epomis which are some of the darkest animals you could imagine so epomis is a shelled beetle but it also has a kind of chunky larva and both the adult and the larva have sharp jaws it's not very big the biggest get to be the size of an almond or something you know but what these beetles do <sighs> so okay you know that frogs and toads are big predators of many beetles and epomis at first glance is no different in fact it relies on the frog's reflex to eat it as a larva and as an adult but immediately after the frog consumes it epomis goes berserk it starts eating the frog from inside out even the larva which is really small can kill full-grown toads and it's an Israeli scientist team did a research about these beetles and they filmed their behavior when confronted with different kinds of frogs and toads and it's really scary but in all cases all epomis beetles larva or adult killed the frogs in some cases the adults even like turned towards the frogs and ran at them with this kind of scramble like you know we joke we say that in these horror films alien whatever when these animals creatures attack people it's unnaturally savage but this was the exception to the rule the little beetles the epomis beetles really fucked those frogs up it was scary and it's you, when you watch the research videos and and you can find them very easily it's really scary that they really go at these frogs so something similar might affect the behavior of parasitic insects sorry parasitic copepods in the sea and as i told these copepods they're not too distantly related to these sand fleas that 
normally you find them everywhere all over the world you know here in the mediterranean coast we have them last year i was in california they were swarming all over the sand on a beach and i actually had a really nice time eating them like like chips salty and they taste really good so but this kid for some reason was faced with a population of sand fleas that associated large things i don't know how they uh, so maybe they came to his sweat maybe they came to the heat but for whatever reason they associated large bodied animals with prey and instead of escaping the sand chiggers started swarming all over their legs like very interesting behavioral change of course i think we will see more such uh, cases in the future not because australia is a continent of death but because australia is a hugely biodiverse region that happens to be inhabited by a growing population of people who have a habit of frequenting the beaches so it's almost like a case of evolution in action one behavior change can give rise to a different population that population will become physically differentiated as their behavior is rewarded and so on so forth and who knows how this will pan out and ultimately this interesting story leads us to an interesting point about evolution itself so i mean there's no doubt that evolution is a real thing okay but its mechanisms are still being uh, how do you say taught about sorry let's take a coffee sip before diving deeper into this interesting area so i don't know only a vegetable would deny evolution as a real force in nature but you see the rates and the mechanisms through which evolution evolves you know it used to be that there was this theory called lamarckism which postulated that as organisms change or act in strange ways their bodies somehow record the, these changes so as a giraffe stretches towards branches their necks grow longer and this somehow gets inherited now this was known as lamarckism and you know people looked at certain obvious things that for example men aren't born with circumcision or so it wasn't supported by evidence and it became superseded by the darwinian approach which postulated uh, a sort of mutating method of evolution so mutations come first some animals are lucky they win this mutation lottery they're advantaged and they pass these advantages on to their offspring through their genes and then of course genes themselves began to be seen as the locus of evolution i mean the whole concept of the selfish gene you know that the animals are basically vehicles for genes to make their own copies and that was also a popular perspective but now when we are looking deeper and deeper into genes we are uncovering these exciting things for example it was reported a few months ago that octopuses at these certain species can edit parts of their genome on the fly so genes are not as cast in stone as we could like to think so maybe lamarck wasn't exactly wrong 
it wasn't as crude as he, he postulated, you know, you didn't physically stretch your neck or whatever, but it seems that some characteristics acquired through an organism's life do reflect in their genetic makeup. And what I'm getting with this is that there have always been these debates about the method and the rate of evolution. For example, we still don't properly know how evolution speeds up after a great extinction or how certain large changes like the evolution of birds, for example, accelerated in certain regions at certain periods of time. We don't know exactly what causes these rev-ups in evolutionary change. And this whole debate brings me to this one pet hypothesis that I have in my mind. So it's not even a theory, it's a hypothesis. But so through the example of things like that Epomis beetle or possibly these sand fleas who decide to become predators first and then the changes come, it seems that behavior may be not just an important part, but the primary driving part of evolution. Think about it. Just, 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 just think about it. So what I'm saying is mutations do occur, of course. They are, they are an evolutionary lottery. But let's look at the hypothetical case of the evolution of the whale. You know, a small hoofed or carnivorous mammal has I don't know shorter legs and because he is lucky he can swim better and then maybe he catches a fish and grows bigger or faster more energy has babies those babies also shorter legs you know evolutionary lottery but why did that water mammal go to the water in the first place? You know, you see, something changes with the behavior first. It's not like the animal was born with shorter legs and he was bullied in school. It's like, I'm going to go to the sea, never come back. And then becomes a whale. No, no, no. They are in the sea first. They decide, they consciously decide to exploit that habitat yeah maybe they're forced to because there's i don't know a scarcity of food on the land whatever but it still comes down to the behavioral initiative that one animal or a population of animals takes and that initiative increases their chances for the mutation when and if that happens of course, this animal of this, this example of the swimming animal, the mammal was very crude, very papier, papier mache model. It's very simplified. But think about it. The behavior of these little animals. I mean, I personally have the belief like opinion that almost all animals, if not all life, is conscious at the level you are conscious of yourself. Yeah, maybe they're dumber, they have more ingrained reflexes, but I don't think anything in nature is this Cartesian flesh robot that 19th century science convinced people that animals were. You know, that animals are just a bundle of reflexes, they are organic robots and only people for some reason have an intelligence and a sense of the self. But no, obviously we see play behavior in a lot of animals, a lot of mammals, but also in very surprising uh, anim group, also in surprising other groups such as fish or reptiles or amphibians. Like these animals have play behavior, so they enjoy themselves. And if you're around 
living things, you would notice that, I mean, you can see sometimes, you can feel that an animal is feeling content or happy or sad or distressed. You don't need to get a blood sample and measure the adrenaline inside to know that because you know you have homologous features like we have all the same hand bones as a lizard does or a mammal does well or a bat does or a seal does so why not homologous feelings too so this i'm gonna sum it up you know we kind of gone all over the place with this but hear me out it's somewhat likely that behavior is the prime driver for evolutionary change and an animal needs to change their behavior first and then he becomes eligible for the lottery of mutation and if all animals are conscious, they have a sense of self. Now, I'm not saying they're smart or they have human emotions, but practically all beings may have the sense of self. So this can lead to a scenario in which creatures can become what you want to be. <laughs> really, I mean, it sounds like a kind of uh, emotional Hollywood things, but behavior comes from within us. So if an organism wants to change and makes that change, the drive to change physically, genetically, evolutionarily might come first and foremost from the within and that's very interesting please write your thoughts about this idea i mean look i read a lot of books about evolution zoology biology i follow all the news and articles but i'm not a certified zoologist or a biologist i'm an armchair guy it's better this way but to the best of my knowledge except for maybe the all creatures are equally conscious bit. This sounds like a reasonable hypothesis to entertain. I wonder how that goes in plants, which seem to have no sense of self. Or do they? But maybe that would explain the enormous number of lateral gene transfers in plants and the more direct lines of descent in animals because having a sense of self animals are more capable of initiating these generation long evolutionary changes and plants are more left to the wind and to ensure a safety against not having a in brackets personal drive of evolutionary change they're open to lateral genetic penetration i don't know so yeah half an hour of evolutionary speculation we went from this interesting bit of bloody news from australia to the potential of anticoagulant drugs to a new way of at least looking at the mechanism or behind evolutionary change life is interesting guys please comment below this video you know write what you think about this hypothesis do you think it's bullshit do you think it's interesting if you are in any way aff affiliated with research or like if you're a real scientist, not an armchair guy like me, please, I really want to know your opinion on this shit. Both about the anticoagulant in the sand bit, bit but also about this 
personal initiative driven evolutionary hypothesis. So that's that, ladies and gents. Have a nice day. This has been C.M. Kozaman.